Well, I appreciate being here tonight. I was coming anyway. I was really excited to, to listen to these two gentlemen. This is, I think, is going to be a fantastic seminar. So um, I want to also thank the Solar Energy Society of Alberta team for putting this together. And I heard that it was your 40th anniversary. Is that correct? So congratulations on that. That's, that's great. Um, I appreciate you guys bringing together all these like-minded Albertans and forward-thinking Albertans. Um, we know that climate change is real. We know it's dangerous. We know that rising temperatures are happening worldwide. And in Alberta, we have a responsibility, an undeniable responsibility to meet this challenge head on. Uh, we all have a stake in our success and we all lose in the event of a failure. Through our climate plan with the government of Alberta, we've outlined, outlined our core approach to energy and environment and the economy. And the plan is founded on, uh, some of you may know this, uh, partly a carbon levy, uh, the elimination of emissions from coal-fired power plants, an increase in renewable energy, which is something we're here about tonight, and natural gas for electricity generation by 2030. A limit on oil sands emissions to encourage innovation and efficiency, which is a big deal for my area because I have a lot of oil and gas firms. So I'm, I'm, that's one of the reasons why I'm here to show them that uh, there's a lot of options out there. Uh, and also a 45% decrease in methane emissions from 2014 levels to 2025. And in, uh, in the spring, we did pass that Climate Leadership Implementation Act. And the act establishes this economy-wide price on carbon, which applies to all fuels that emit gases when it combusted. And it also talks about how we will spend this money. So that will be, a lot of that will be coming out shortly, which I'm excited about. We will reinvest the levy in the economy to create jobs, accelerate greenhouse gas reduction, and diversify the energy industry. And, and when I say diversify, I think sometimes people think um, diversify is, is getting rid of one whole energy industry. But for me, like I said, with my area, what I think about is, is different and new ways of doing things and using the skills uh, and the trades that we have and the people in this province. Um, one of our aims, obviously, is to eliminate carbon pollution by putting a price on it. And, and we know that while it's easy to talk about energy efficiency, reducing emissions is going to be difficult, but there are a lot of ways that we can do that. Um, one of the ways we've started is we've established an Energy Efficiency Alberta um, program that supports efficiency programs and services throughout the province, and including small-scale microgeneration, which is which hopefully a lot of you guys have here. I'm getting solar panels pretty quick on my house. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and this is going to allow Albertans, obviously, to, to lower their energy bills and their energy usage. Um, we also, with that energy efficiency agency, we cre created an advisory panel in June, which has been going around create, um, collecting a lot of information. Um, and it's going to help us down this path. So what we're hoping for and what we've, what we've talked about in the media is, is by 2030, a 30% um, renewable energy usage by 2030. Um, the way, in my, my view, when I look at it, the way technology is evolving, how fast it's, it's evolving, who knows? That could be a lot faster depending on people like you, depending on the industries we have here that are looking into this. Um, these programs with energy efficiency are going to be launching in, in August, or sorry, January 2017, based on ideas from a lot of Albertans. Um, anyone can submit their ideas still, so if you guys have any ideas, obviously a lot of you probably do. Go online, the Alberta websites, the government websites. You can uh, input your, uh, your ideas and your submissions still. Um, and we have been having a lot of energy efficiency open houses. I think one actually I was here at uh, Grand Mac for. Um, in my constituency, Leduc Beaumont, we have seen a great increase in, uh, in the interest for renewable energy, which is nice. The city of Leduc actually installed the largest municipal rooftop solar array in Canada on the rec center which is going to be saving the taxpayers a lot of money on, on that investment down the road. And it's, if anybody of you haven't seen it, I would encourage going online. There's some NMAX did it and there are some videos online of it. It is absolutely incredible. There's a drone video that goes over top and shows what's going on there. And it's, uh, it's something else, I'll tell you. I'm pretty excited. It's not even done yet either. There's, there's going to be even more of it coming. So I encourage you guys to look at it. The other thing that I'm, uh, I'm excited about is at Leduc Number One Energy Discovery Center, which was the first big oil boom in 1947. Um, it used to be, well, it's called the Energy Discovery Center, but it was always just oil and gas. And slowly they've tried to evolve and, and bring other energies in there. So there's a project there called the Living Energy Project that I'm kind of standing behind and supporting. Um, 
that wants to show, and this is something I always say, how we can complement and supplement our fossil fuel usage um, in the coming years, because we know that you know we can't really turn that off right now. We need to work together on these. And one of the possibilities that we're doing with that, or what we're trying to show, um, is the geothermal potential of abandoned wells, which there are a lot of companies that have been looking into this, but they've never had a government official like myself that has, to be frank, listened to them. Um, so what we're doing there in that project is actually, there's, it started out kind of small actually. We started with um, a solar array, but then we talked about the biggest solar tracker in North America, which is gonna go in there, a wind turbine, combined heat and power, and then we're using oil service firms, and this is something that I wanted for my area because of the workers out there and the tradesmen and the skills. Well, we're using those men and women to look at converting uh, the oil well to use geothermal for it, and we can power part of the building. So we're gonna use solar to power the pumps and everything, to pump the water through, to bring the geothermal energy out to heat and cool, and, uh, and use that for the building. And we're gonna have a whole energy system to show students, tourists, everybody who comes there. And it's gonna be live. What our plan is to be live, online. Anybody can use it. Anybody can see what's out there. So that's a, a big one that we're trying, we're trying to go forward with Alberta Energy Regulator. We've asked them to let us pilot that. Um, just waiting to hear on that. I'm pretty excited. Hopefully, hopefully we hear something soon. Um, I say we, but I guess it's those guys that are doing the project. I'm supporting it. It's, uh, it's quite, a, quite an interesting project. So um, I could talk all day about that. I want to hear these guys, so I'll stop. Um, but we know that on, on those kind of fronts there, engaging with Albertans is a big deal. That's something we need to do. We're going to continue to do that throughout all these proce processes so that our industries and our, and our workers and our communities are involved in, uh, in transforming their own places where they live and, and making things better for their kids, their grandchildren. I have two kids, so that's a big, one big reason why I'm really involved in this and excited about it. Um, so for a transition to a low carbon economy, we really need to work together. And I think that's a, that's a big one that I always say, it's not an us versus them scenario. It's about working together and as Albertans and using the technology and the innovation that we have, because we're second to none in the world to people right now with, with what we can do here. So. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more from, from these gentlemen. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. I have my cards with me, so if, if anybody wants to come and um, pick my brain, if I can answer you, I will, but if I can, I'll get you the information if I can. Um, so I encourage you, please come up and, and have a chat and um, after these guys are done, obviously, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So thanks again, I really appreciate being here, you guys. This is fantastic, and, and I'm looking forward to it. So thanks, you guys. So, so thanks, Rob, and thanks everyone at CISA. Thanks to MLA Anderson for, for the, the talk at the, the start here. A lot of what I was going to say on this first slide, actually, um, has already been said by Rob tonight. So thanks for making my part easy here. Um, so I'm Evan Wilson. I'm with the Canadian Wind Energy Association, and this is my colleague Patrick Bateman with the Canadian Solar Industries Association. And today we are going to be talking about Alberta, a renewable energy superpower, question mark. Um, as Rob said, uh, I mean, you're going to find out it's not a question mark. That's the spoiler there. But um, So I'm with the Canadian Wind Energy Association. Patrick is with the, the Canadian Solar Industries Association. Uh, we are both representatives of these two industries. And, and just like the technology of wind and the technology of, of, of solar uh, are complementary, a lot of the work we've been doing here in Alberta is quite complimentary, so we thought that the two of us could get together and, and give this presentation. So we're gonna walk through a couple of things here. We'll, we'll do a, a quick overview of what the, the policy and, and the, the framework looks like around the world. Uh, we'll get into some questions of, of the price of renewables and reliability on renewables. Um, and so, so we will be taking questions as we speak, but two requests for questions. First one, keep the hard ones till the end, please. Or, number two, give the hard ones to Patrick when he's up here. So that's all I ask. That's it. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Patrick here for a couple of minutes to go over the, the international and national frameworks that, that we're working within right now. So we felt <clears throat> that it would be important uh, to, to frame what Alberta is undertaking here um, in a global, a global context. 
uh, because Alberta is not the only jurisdiction in the world uh, who's moving ahead ambitiously on climate action. Um, the first piece of policy that we wanted to describe here for, for context uh, is the Paris Agreement. Um, as many of you will know, uh, it was agreed upon in, in, in December um, at the uh, Conference of the Parties 21 in Paris. Um, it's for the first time brings together all nations on a common cause uh, to, to take ambitious climate action. And it charts a new course uh, for in the global climate effort to limit global emissions uh, to uh, two degrees above pre-industrial levels, um, with an aspiration to less uh, than, than, than uh, 1.5 degrees. Uh, at this moment, uh, more than 60 countries have, uh, have ratified it, and uh, that represents more than 47 or 48 percent of global emissions. The reason why that's important is because uh, there's two, two or th there's a number of different thresholds which need to be met uh, by all the countries before for it to come into effect. Uh, the first is uh, more than 55 countries have to ratify it, so we're already past that threshold. The second is that uh, those 55 or those more than 55 countries have to represent uh, more than 55 percent of global emissions, and uh, Canada is set to, to ratify it as are several other major economies in the coming weeks. Uh, so for the first time, we're going to have a global, uh, globally ratified, uh, binding uh, climate action uh, framework. Um, so that was December, and that was agreed, agreed upon. In March, uh, the Vancouver de Declaration was agreed upon by all of the first ministers uh, across Canada. And uh, this, again, was the first time that we've had a comprehensive agreement from, from all the premiers and, and such to, uh, to, to work together to, uh, to fight climate change and to develop our, uh, our, our clean economy of the future. Um, to create the national strategy, uh, there were a number of different federal, provincial, territorial working groups created coming out of this March meeting. That's what the FPT stands for there. Uh, those working groups were on mitigation, adaptation, uh, carbon pricing, clean tech and jobs. So really covering the full gamut of the different things that uh, the different things that a climate uh, change framework needs to address, but also many of the, the things that will create the opportunities that climate change can, can address as we, as we transition. Um, what this will give rise to is a, a pan-Canadian climate change framework. Um, we're now in the final stages um, of the development of, of, uh, of this policy framework, and um, it's beginning to infiltrate into every different area of activity uh, within all of the different levels of government across Canada. Um, we're beginning to see some early announcements uh, from, the, from what this framework will, will bring. Uh, Minister McKenna uh, in the past weeks has, has talked about uh, the, the, the desire to have carbon pricing or a minimum level of carbon pricing in every uh, Canadian jurisdiction. Um, also, uh, the announcement that our, our national emissions reduction floor uh, will be 30% by 2030. And uh, believe me, the, the strategy that's being developed at the moment and that the level of uh, effort and uh, collaboration at the different levels of government mean for the first time Canada's really got to be on a, a charting a course to, to, to really make uh, inroads on climate change. Great, and so, so, so zooming in on a little bit more local here, we'll just do a quick uh, recap of some of the things that we've already heard from uh, Emily Anderson that the Alberta government is doing, um, and as well I see some faces from the government here, and it's a lot more intimidating than doing this in Calgary where no one from government knows your you may be saying things wrong, but I'm going to try. So uh, earlier this month in September, uh, Shannon Phillips, the Minister uh, of Environment and Parks and responsible for climate change, announced uh, several targets for government when it came to the introduction of renewables. Uh, the first being that there would be a minimum of 30% of the electricity used in Alberta by 2030 would come from renewable sources. And in order to support that goal, the government would be supporting 5,000 megawatts of generating capacity in the province. In addition to, to those things, we'll, we're, we're looking down uh, to, to see uh, several supports for small and uh, small scale, community scale, and micro generation. And all of these together between the procurement and between these, these small scale programs, that's what the government will be doing to hit this 30% of demand to be met by renewables. Um, but the thing is, just to, to give a little bit more context, this isn't, as, this isn't as straightforward as it seems. In Saskatchewan right now, they're also putting, um, they're putting renewables on the grid and, and SAS Power will just be able to 
procure that electricity that they need. They'll be procuring 200 to 300 megawatts of new wind every year, 20 megawatts of, of new uh, solar, utility scale solar every year, and that's how they're gonna hit their targets. In, in here in Alberta, given the energy only market and, and the desire to maintain uh, the energy only market, there are, um, you know, there are a couple of more steps than, than, than they have to do in Saskatchewan. So just to give people an idea of the complexity of hitting these goals here in Alberta, I just want to go over some of the other things that are, that are going on. And forgive me uh, for any that I miss along here. And if I'm missing anything, raise your hand and, and take credit for it as well. Um, so, so let's just start back in November of last year um, when the climate leadership plan was announced. Uh, four big goals of the climate leadership plan, the ending of coal pollution from electricity in Alberta, uh, the introduction of a carbon levy and a rebate program for people that will be charged the levy, uh, capping oil sands emissions and reducing methane emissions. These goals were turned into the uh, parts of the Climate Leadership Act that, uh, that, that was discussed earlier this evening. And all of them are, 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 will have impacts on the way that uh, electricity uh, and renewables is added to the grid over the next 14 years here. So just some of, some of the, the, the programs that are going on here, I just wanna go through them so everybody knows how many balls are in the air and how many things uh, the government is balancing to make sure that this 30% goal is hit. Um, so so uh, a sampling here on March 3rd, the, um, the Alberta Electricity Systems Operator started the renew, uh, engaged on a renewable energy program, uh, procurement program in order to make a recommendation to government What's the best way for government to provide um, certainty for people to, to develop utility scale renewables in the province? From the climate leadership uh, uh, report, that the Leach report, uh, there was a recommendation of a renewable energy credit of about $35, but the ISO was given the ability to, to make its own recommendation based on that recommendation of the report. Uh, so they began the work in March. Also in March, the government announced that all coal would be phased out of the province by 2030, and Terry Boston was brought on as the coal phase-out facilitator in order to determine, okay, what is the, the best way to make sure that, uh, that coal is phased out, to make sure that, that, uh, that coal generators uh, get some sort of, or, or look into whether or not they should be getting some sort of compensation for being phased out, as well as just making sure that, that uh, there is some sort of plan for when there is no coal here in the province, at least as far as, um, you know, as, as, far as there's a plan for, for the incumbent generators there. Uh, in May, the, the systems operator made the recommendation to the government of Alberta for what kind of procurement process we should have. Uh, that has been, we know that, that there's been a recommendation given to government. We don't know what that recommendation was. We don't know what cabinet will, will make of that recommendation we don't know what kind of procurement it's actually going to be. So we're still waiting for what the coal phase out facilitator is saying. We're still waiting for what the government is going to be doing on the procurement. Two big things that will impact how renewables are brought onto the grid. Um, so as well as we move here, uh, June 9th, the energy efficiency panel was announced. The energy efficiency panel, which is, uh, which is expecting all of its, um, all of its, its, its uh, recommendations from the public to be made by the end of this week. Um, they are doing work to determine what are some energy efficiency programs for small scale and community scale generation. Some work on the, the review of the micro generation regulation. They're still waiting for comment from, from Albertans like us in the room. So we don't know what they're saying or what they're going to recommend yet on community scale or small scale generation. So that's another question mark here. That's another part of the process that, that's gonna be required. Another, uh, another thing that we need to learn more about before we hear what's going to be brought onto the grid. And then that brings us to September 14th with the 30% target and the 5,000 megawatt uh, support. That was, that was uh, from the government a, a sign that there's gonna be support on this. We, we know that we can support 5,000 megawatts of new generation. So be prepared uh, project proponents and people who, who want to build uh, utility and community scale renewables. This is the kind of support that we're giving. This is what we know our grid can support. Um, and then looking ahead to, to 2017, 
January 1st, the carbon levy will, will be introduced at $20 a ton. Um, sometime in Q1, as was discussed, energy efficiency Alberta programs will commence, which will have some impact on, on renewables coming online. And as well, uh, 2017 will mark the end of the specified gas emitters regulation. Uh, that was for, at the time, that was for large emitters. That was the carbon levy that they were paying um, in order to incent reduction or offsetting of large emissions from these large emitters. Uh, based on the work of the, the, the climate change panel, that's gonna be replaced with a performance standard in, in different industries in order to reduce via this performance standard and uh, another pay, uh, sorry, another levy that would come from that. Um, there is a performance standard that will be set for electricity that again will have some impact on how uh, companies decide to participate in renewables. The thing to think about here is the performance standard applying to electricity, there are a lot of, as far as wind goes, a lot of, there, there's a lot of wind capacity and a lot of interest from incumbent uh, generators that, that typically use natural gas and coal because if they have wind in their fleet, if they have some solar in their fleet, they can reduce their overall emissions. They can invest in offsets from people that are doing that. So this performance standard, uh, the work, uh, the, the public consultation of which started last week in phase one will also have an impact um, you know, down the road in, in 2017 on how companies approach renewables. And then again, uh, the, the carbon levy goes up to $30 a ton on January 1st, 2018. So, uh, so, so hopefully I didn't rush through that too quickly, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the complexity and all the moving parts that are going to influence how renewables come on, what's picked, what the, the, the prices are going to be, and all of the things that not only the government has to take into account, but also that you're going to see uh, investors and developers taking into account as well. Great, are there any, is there anything I missed? So the next time that we do this, I know. No, okay, moving on quickly. Um, <laughs> to our key message for the day. So today, um, we, we just want to, if there's a message for anyone to take away from this today, it is that uh, Patrick and I would like to show you that 30% renewables is, is going to be possible in this province in 2030. We hear a lot of criticisms about what's the cost gonna be, what's the reliability of this going to be, and uh, over the next little bit here, we just wanna walk through, um, you know, we wanna spend some time walking through why we know and why we're confident that we are going to be able to achieve this goal both cost effectively for Albertans uh, and reliably so we know that the lights will turn on uh, you know, when, we, when we want them to turn on. So I'll bring Patrick up for, for a second here. So <clears throat> in preparation uh, for, for this presentation, uh, we spent some time scanning the, uh, scanning the recent headlines and newspapers to try to see uh, what's being said out there that's questioning whether 30% by 2030 uh, is achievable. And as I'm sure you all know, it didn't take long for us to begin to turn them up and up and up and up. Uh, but we found one which, uh, which we felt really characterized uh, some of the, the, the key myths uh, that are being pervaded in the media and, and elsewhere. Um, and that's that, there's, that there needs to be a trade-off between low emissions, low cost, and, and reliability. Uh, there's this sense that you can't have all three. You can, you can pick your favorite two, but you're going you're gonna to lose out in the third. And uh, you know, we know that it's, uh, it, it's simply not true. Um, so the, the remainder of this presentation is, is going to be uh, in, in two parts. Evan's going to speak uh, to the lowest cost piece, and I'm going to tackle uh, reliability. Um, so I'll just remind everybody we're, we're really open to receiving questions uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, but do bear in mind that if it's cost related, uh, keep it to Evan. If it's reliability, uh, I'll, I'll take it on later on. Uh, we're, we're conscious that the, the presentation is... Uh, uh, I'm not going to say it's long, but we've got a lot of information to present. So if you do have a question that's directly related to what's being said at that time, uh, please bring it up. If it's uh, a little bit tangential, uh, keep it until the end of the session so that we can make sure that we keep on uh, moving through the presentation. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Evan for uh, some considerations around uh, renewables, 30% by 2030, and cost effectiveness. 
Great, so just to give some context to that warning Patrick gave, uh, pretty much every question that came uh, about reliability during the cost section was answered in the reliability section. So we've got it all covered. Um, and uh, yeah, trust us, I guess. Um, so the, the things that we'll talk about here in the cost effectiveness uh, part of the discussion is um, just two things really. Uh, how much wind and solar do we already have today uh, in, in Alberta and Canada to show that you know, we already are at a point here in Alberta and throughout the country where you know, renewables are already cost competitive and cost effective um, under, under circumstances both in Alberta and across the country. Um, and, and we're seeing these costs being reduced over time as well. There's been quite, some quite significant, um, some, some cost and, and pricing trends that have shown this trending down. And, uh, and, and so the two of those together is just an illustration for people here as to uh, what we're already seeing and, and what, we can, what we can hopefully expect in the future. So the first thing here is just a, a, a quick graph of how uh, the, the capacity for wind has grown in Alberta over the last five years. Currently, we're, we're at about 1,500 megawatts, uh, and that was at 1,000 megawatts uh, just five years ago. And the thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, there has been electricity uh, generated by wind here in Alberta for 20 years. And uh, so, so they're, they're always, or not always, but for the last 20 years, there has been the, the economic case to develop wind here in, in Alberta. And uh, we're seeing that people are, are already making it work. That, that uh, 1,500 megawatts or so, that is, that's approximately or just under about 10% of the entire generating capacity of the whole province. As far as what's actually being generated with that, uh, we're looking at about 5% of electricity uh, is provided by wind. Uh, every year. It was, a, it was a windy afternoon here in Calgary, so I looked, and, and, and this afternoon we were looking at about 18% of, of generation came from wind uh, across the province this afternoon. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, solar isn't, uh, is a more of a national success story, I would say, uh, compared to wind. As you can see, we, we went through the same, same time scale here. We went back to 2011. And as you can see, we went from about 500 megawatts in 2011 all the way up to 2,500 megawatts across the country um, in solar uh, generation. Alberta is a fraction of that, but, but one thing to keep in mind is that if you look at the the, the ASOS project queue where, where people put their projects in to say they, they are intending to construct new generation and they want it connected to the grid. We're looking at about 600 megawatts of, of projects that people are waiting to build. And that's just the projects over five megawatts. Over five megawatts, that's when the ASO starts paying attention, and there's significant potential for projects uh, smaller than, than five megawatts. And so the next slide that I'll show here, um, I, I think shows a, a really good reason for why we're seeing this kind of growth, especially in solar uh, across the country. Uh, these graphs, uh, probably some of you have seen them before, they come from uh, Lazard's Levelized Costs of Electricity Analysis from 2015. If we take a look at utility scale solar, uh, we've, we're seeing a drop of 80, 82% uh, in, in the levelized cost or just the cost of electricity there. Um, that kind of drop is, is mostly coming from the drop in the cost of, of solar modules, which is making it more attractive to install more solar modules, uh, both across Canada and, and across uh, the United States. Um, other things, other factors that have driven that is, is improved supply chains, uh, reduced cost of installation as people get more efficient and more effective at doing it. They know how to do it better, and so it's getting cheaper and cheaper to do. Um, wind has also dropped, not quite as dramatically, but 61% is a still a pretty dramatic drop. That's what we've seen in, in, in wind here. That's the, the way that the cost of wind amortized over the life of the project has dropped. That's because of reasons like technology is getting better, wind turbines and blades are getting better, so they're, they're pulling more electricity uh, from the kinetic energy. Towers are getting higher. Um, lots of different technological reasons are driving this, this drop in, in uh, the cost of, of 
electricity uh, driven by wind as it is in solar. Uh, one thing that, uh, that I, I will point out though is that these costs are in American dollars. It was an American survey and so um, you know, the cost of, of the levelized cost of electricity we'd see in Alberta or in Canada wouldn't quite be, a lot of the, the, the falls have been captured by things like, um, you know, the change in the exchange rate. But as more is brought onto the grid, both solar and wind, you can expect to see drops uh, even further, even though the dollar values wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, be, be equivalent to, to what we're seeing up here. Just really quickly, can you explain the two categories in the uh, solar and the uh, two different cost categories? Yeah, so the two different, Patrick, do you know what those two different cost categories are? Uh, typically, they would take a uh, survey of a variety of different projects, and then they'll have margin of error bars. So the more expensive uh, are, are toward the top, the less expensive. So what it's presenting is uh, an estimate of the range of pricing uh, at a given time. There's like an orange and then sort of pale yellow, it seems like for each year. Oh, sorry. On the solar side, there's, there's two different, different numbers, it looks like. Uh, from the angle that I'm sitting at. Uh, I don't have the answers to that. We can, okay, we can sorry. Back. Yeah, we can get back to you on that. Thank you. Thank you. One's by California. <laughs> I think it, uh, just, just looking at it again, I think it might be a uh, rooftop and it's going to be scaled. But I don't think oh, that would make some sense. Sorry. And the next thing we'll move on to here is uh, some, just some quick discussion of what the pricing trends for wind and solar is. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the things you hear about the increased installation of, of renewables onto the grid is, you know, what's this, what's this going to cost? How is this cost competitive? This is new, is this going to work? And so what Patrick and I did, we, we went through reports of what some various uh, competitive procurements were in 2015. These are 2015 US dollars here. These came from uh, PPAs uh, across the world. And just, it's a quick review of them just to, just to show people when you scale up your, your fleet of renewables, what kind of costs or what kind of prices you're getting here. So uh, on the solar side, in Dubai, there was a, a PPA a, a, in a recent procurement that was at $30 per megawatt hour. Mexico at $39 per megawatt hour. California was procuring uh, last year at $41 per megawatt hour and Peru at $48 per megawatt hour. On the wind side, uh, in Morocco, where, where they're, they're expanding wind significantly, we're looking at $30 a megawatt hour. Mexico is $43 a megawatt hour. Quebec uh, last year got $63 per megawatt hour, and an average of several uh, uh, projects in the United States was $61 per megawatt hour. Um, and those are, all, those are all places that have had uh, quite aggressive targets, quite aggressive procurements, and have been able to get uh, quite competitive, uh, um, have gotten quite competitive uh, 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 PPAs out of the process. Right now in Alberta, the estimate that we have, it's not quite as low as, as those. Uh, in Alberta right now, uh, we're looking at about $84 a megawatt hour is the estimate we typically hear, but you know, that's at 1,500 megawatts. As, as we grow the supply, uh, we will see efficiencies and we will see drops in the, the price of wind. And Patrick, what is the, the number that you've been saying for, for, uh, for solar? Somewhere between about 100 bucks uh, and 150 bucks per megawatt hour, depending on project size, location, and finance and their considerations. So that was uh, between 100 and 150 is what Patrick said for people that couldn't hear. So is that US dollar or Canadian? Alberta. US dollars was, was what I was quoting there, yeah. Pardon? For, uh, yeah, that's, that's the figure to, to make it fit with this. Oh, and the solar was in Canadian. Yeah. Yes, back here. Okay, so the question here was, what is competitive procurement and what is selling versus buying price? So competitive procurement would be uh, when, a, when a jurisdiction or a system operator puts a call out for a tender, more or less, to procure a certain amount of electricity. So if they say that they need either a certain generating capacity or it can even be uh, a certain amount of generation, they put a call out to the market, they see 
what, um, you know, they, they would put out a request for qualifications to see who could participate. Uh, they determine based on the size of the company, their, their financial assets, their success with other projects, who should be involved in the procurement process. And then from there, they, they put out specs on what kind of, um, you know, what, what kind of generation they're looking for. And uh, they will, you know, they'll, they'll go through a number of factors that, that these companies compete on with price being um, a, a, a pretty significant factor. So the price that, that, that you're, you'd be seeing here typically is what the, uh, the system operator would be paying the generator for their electricity. Yes, question. Uh, all the, all the, everything you talked about as far as the, the cost of production, is there any correlation between that and the cost of the end user? Because again, these water stores coming out of cost of electricity in Ontario for rural uh, people. I live in a rural area, so I'm very much concerned. What can I expect in our cost of electricity will be when it seems of our land? Right, so, so this, this, you know, the cost of electricity that you would see here in the PPAs, um, you know, that electricity cost plus other fees could be passed on to, to you there as well. Your bill would have your, your transmission costs that, that you get now. But the thing to keep in mind about uh, Ontario and, and some of the increases that they've seen there is they're also in the process of paying to refurbish nuclear plants. They're, they're, they're paying to refurbish uh, uh, natural gas plants that they have. The increases that you're seeing in Ontario are um, due to a suite of, of different uh, maintenance programs that they're doing on, on different, a different generating fleet to bring that up to a, uh, a more modern level. And it's the combination of a lot of those um, if you look uh, for, for, I think it's the, the, the renewable section on the bill in Ontario, and Patrick, back me up or, or correct me if I'm wrong on this, is about, it's about 20% is, is, a, is about what the, or 20 cents on every dollar? Uh, it's not far from that, I don't know exactly. And, and it's about double that for the natural gas or the nuclear refurbishment cost. The, uh, just to, to add a comment, the, the, key, uh, the key issue with rural Ontarian electric, electricity bills is the cost of delivering the electricity. The uh, actual generation costs are uh, a much smaller component of the bill. Um, rural Ontarians pay more uh, for the delivery of electricity uh, than urban customers because uh, there's less customers in the rural areas to, uh, to which to spread the, uh, the cost of delivering the electricity. Uh, so the, the, the regulatory structure is currently being reviewed and uh, they're going to begin to use, uh, to subsidize rural electricity customers with, uh, with some of the capacity within urban areas. So it's a little bit of a different, uh, it's a little bit of an apples to, to oranges comparison uh, with these numbers here. Yeah, the same problems here. Thank you for that question. Are there any other questions? All right. Well, so hopefully uh, some of that discussion will, will show how we can get low cost uh, electricity from renewables and the, the, the worries that the generation of uh, renewables itself will lead to higher costs is really something that we're not seeing bear out in, in other jurisdictions. Uh, and having said that, uh, I think we'll move on to a discussion of reliability and Patrick if you can come up and uh, and share some things here all right so uh, bring us back to this quote here from the newspaper talking about trade-offs between costs between emissions and, uh, and reliability uh, so now I'm going to talk about some of the some of the myths uh, around uh, around reliability that we tend to hear, and some of the answers, uh, some of the some of the information that corrects some of those myths. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to address four key questions here. Uh, I'm going to compare this 30% by 2030 target with some other jurisdictions. Uh, also, going to uh, describe some of the changes that it'll bring uh, for the electricity system. Uh, talk about some of the myths around variable generation and also um, some, some of the ways in which variable generation can be reliably integrated. And it's just occurring to me that uh, maybe variable generation is, is a little bit jargony 
Um, so variable generation uh, uses a resource which, which fluctuates, uh, like wind or like solar, uh, whereas non-variable generation are things like uh, coal plants or gas, where uh, in varying degrees you can turn them up or turn them down as you wish. It just depends how much uh, fuel you, uh, you, you put in there. So there's, uh, I guess you could say that there's a little bit more control with the non-variable generation. Um, so the comparison to other jurisdictions, 30% by 2030. Uh, the first thing to remind everybody is that Canada is already a leader uh, globally in renewable electricity production. We're already more than 65% uh, of our, meeting more than 65% of our annual electricity needs uh, with renewables. And that's pretty remarkable. Uh, we're, we're, we're up there toward the top of the, the global ranks as a country. Um, of that, wind contributes about 5% or more than 5%. Uh, of our annual demand, and uh, solar is, is still very small, 0.3%, uh, so three, three thousandths, um, but growing rapidly, we're seeing about 30 or 40% uh, compound annual growth each year. Um, when we look at other jurisdictions around the world, yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, hydro is almost all of the rest of it. So you're talking about live hydro then? Like the South Eastern style back Uh Both. Uh, big, big hydro would make up the majority of it, but run of river would also uh, be, a, be a section in there as well. Um, so doing a jurisdictional scan, looking around the world, what we find is that uh, it's not uncommon for, for jurisdictions today uh, to be meeting uh, there are about 20% of their annual needs with wind and uh, more than 2% of their annual needs uh, with, with solar. Um, looking at some of the global leaders here, uh, there's some pretty impressive numbers. Uh, Denmark today, 40% uh, wind. Uh, in the United States, eight, more than, or eight st states met more than 15% from wind, uh, Iowa 31%. Um, what uh, people often are quite surprised by is that it, it, Italy, Germany, and Greece all get about between 7 and 9% of their uh, electricity annually from solar, uh, which is pr pretty impressive. Um, between 20 and 30 countries uh, meet more than 1% of their annual electricity needs with, with solar. So there's some pretty, uh, pretty impressive precedents out there already. Uh, but the, the important thing to stress here is that uh, you know, every jurisdiction is, uh, is completely different. So uh, it's very difficult to, to compare the, uh, the target of one jurisdiction or what's being achieved in, a, in another jurisdiction uh, with another without taking into account a number of different, uh, very, uh, a number of different factors. Uh, for instance, things like resource availability, do they have uh, resources or not? Um, do they need more electricity? What's the uh, age of their existing uh, infrastructure? Does it need to be replaced? A lot of different uh, considerations like this. So the first kind of conclusion here in the, in the comparison to other jurisdictions is that uh, the 30% by 2030 is being demonstrated as, as possible at least. So I think that's the first check mark here. I think it's definitely within the realms of possibility when we look at other uh, global jurisdictions. Um, the result of that, the benefit of that, is that uh, we can learn from the experiences here uh, of what's being uh, experienced elsewhere in the world. Uh, some of the best practices uh, learn which mistakes not to, not to make again. Uh, some hard lessons have been learned out there. Um, and further to uh, what Evan's been speaking to, uh, one of the biggest benefits here is that Alberta's embarking on this at a time when the costs are three or four times less than when all of these other jurisdictions were doing it. So uh, the time couldn't really be better uh, from a cost perspective. Um, and what the, uh, what the really key success factor that this comes down to now, uh, with, the, with the cost out of the way, is uh, uh, going to be uh, making sure that uh, uh, the system integration is, is done in a reliable fashion, making sure that this transition to having more variable generation from, from resources like wind and solar um, is done in such a way so as to, to, to maintain the integrity, the reliability of the electricity system. Um, so I'm going to move, move on to talk about what are some of the changes uh, that are going to happen in the electricity system as we begin to have more wind and more solar on the grid begin to move toward this 30% by 2030 target. Um, so, I mean, it, uh, it should come as no surprise uh, that it is going to change. Um, and 
in a number of different ways, a number of different very technical ways. So I'm not going to go uh, into any great de level of detail on this, but just to provide a little bit of a scan, some of the things that, that will be begin to change on the system. Uh, demand load patterns shift. So what that means is uh, if you've got a lot of uh, solar electricity generating in houses and businesses, communities across Alberta, um, the system operator, when they're looking at, the, at how much electricity is, is being consumed, um, what they see is that without solar, your, 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 your load or your demand is there. When the solar is generating, it's much less because uh, th that need for electricity is being met on site, which means the system operator has to know and understand how much electricity generation is being generated on site and then account for that in the way in which they uh, dispatch and uh, deliver other electricity. Uh, secondly, distribution. So this is kind of more, more of a local level. If you have a lot of different solar generators or small wind turbines in, in communities, um, there's, there's a number of different things that happen at the, 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 the distribution level. Uh, things, uh, grid stability, interface flows. Interface flows is uh, things like, you know, typically uh, under the traditional model, you've got, uh, you've got your large generator here, you've got your house down here, the electricity flows in one direction. When you begin to put uh, generation down here with the houses, you get the electricity flowing in both directions. During the day, when your uh, solar is generating, the electricity flow is going this way. At night, when your solar generation is not flowing, it's going the other way. And this is, these are new, new, uh, new paradigms for the electricity sector, but uh, as we discussed, there's a lot of uh, uh, precedents out there for, for how this is being managed and handled already. Um, and what we find to be the most common misconception about these changes that are happening to the electricity system is that uh, there's, there's concerns about reliability uh, because there's a perception or a misperception that variable generation, so using wind and solar, is uh, intermittent. And we find, uh, you know, if you look at the def definition of intermittent, it says that it alternately uh, ceases and begin again. So you get this, this idea of on-off, on-off, on-off. Whereas uh, I think a, a, more, a more apt definition is that it's liable to vary your change. Um, the reason for this, uh, it's uh, really down here, these, these two, two bullets at the bottom. Um, if you have, uh, if you can imagine spread out across the whole province of Alberta, um, uh, uh, a large number of wind turbines, a large number of, of solar panels, and they're uh, very uh, geographically dispersed. Um, you're never going to have um, a time when an entire cloud comes and covers the entire province. So when, as clouds come and go, some solar panels will be covered, others won't. And when you, uh, when you stack that all up, what you begin to see is um, you get a, a, very smooth, uh, a very smooth profile. Um, when you combine it with, uh, when, you, when you look at wind, uh, your, your wind may be blowing over here, it's not blowing over here. When you add it all up in the aggregate, it becomes very smooth. Uh, the second key thing is, uh, the second key thing that, that means that it's not on off and it's a much more smooth uh, profile is, the, is when you combine a variety of different, uh, different resources together. Um, and Alberta is, uh, is an ideal place to combine uh, wind and solar electricity generation. On the left-hand side here, uh, what you can see is a, a typical summer day. Um, the blue line along the bottom, uh, along the bottom you've got 1 a.m. in the morning all the way to uh, midnight that, that night. Um, the, the blue along the bottom is the, the wind generation profile. Uh, so what you can see is that in the, in the summer, uh, there's not a great deal of wind uh, generated during the day. Um, in the summer, of course, that's when it's sunniest, it's when solar is most productive. So if you combine solar, excuse me, and wind, uh, you get this much flatter, uh, much, uh, much smoother and flat uh, generation profile. On the right-hand side, uh, this is a typical winter day with the same, same amount of wind and solar installed. Uh, in winter, obviously, during the day, you get less uh, solar energy, uh, but it's when wind is most productive. Um, and, and for that reason, again, you can see that you've got this uh, very nice, smooth uh, generation profile. Right. 
So uh, in the question was uh, why 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 is the price? So the uh, just to point out that the red line um, is the is the typical pool price. What what generators are paid for? Uh, what what they're generating at different times of the, the day. Um, and uh, what we can see in, in the summer is uh, that the um, you've got a real uh, big uh, price spike during the day, and in winter it's much more flat throughout the day. Um, the uh, the key the key driver for, for pool pricing in Alberta is uh, supply demand dynamics. And uh, when your uh, when your uh, when, when, when demand be begins to come close to supply, your, your price spikes. And when you've got much more uh, supply than demand, your, your, your price decreases. So the reason why pool prices are, are so inexpensive today, for instance, is because there's far more uh, supply than demand. Um, what this means for solar, as you can see, uh, in summer you've got this uh, big price spike uh, during the day. And that's the time when, when solar generates most. And what that means is that uh, solar's generation profile lines up very well with uh, the most expensive times during Alberta's uh, low profiles. And for that reason, it can help to mitigate against price spikes on summer's day when it, it, it can quite often happen. What, what is the demand in the summer? Is it very short? What causes that spike? Is there a shortage of energy? There is a... Uh, so, uh, Sorry, Rob. Rob is my taskmaster to repeat the questions. Uh, what, 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 caused the, what causes the increased demand? So air conditioning is, is, is a part of it for sure. Um, and air conditioning is becoming more and more, uh, a more and more important part of the, or is more and more driving uh, load, uh, the, the shape of the load. Um, air conditioning over the past three to five years is, uh, is really beginning to grow. And Alberta is slowly moving uh, from, which would, uh, a province which would typically have been a, a winter load uh, more so to, to a summer load. Um, irrigation uh, in, in agriculture is also a, another big load during the summer as well. So there's a variety of different uh, contributing factors uh, to it. Talk about reliability and miss and In the wintertime, we have snow covering panels. Uh, the load would be the same no matter what time of year. Um, there's a, 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 I don't know if I'll be able to repeat the whole question, but I think what I'll say is that there's a number of different concepts kind of baked in there. So what I'm going to attempt to do is, is address a number of them uh, during the coming slides, and then maybe I'll try and circle back and see if I can uh, help to uh, maybe, maybe narrow in on, on some of the key ones. Um, and this, uh, studies like this one here, which I'm about to speak to, uh, demonstrate uh, some of, the, some of the kind of key concepts around this. Um, so, for instance, the, the Pan-Canadian Wind Integration Study, uh, this is something which was led by CANWIA and also by the federal government. It involved system operators, uh, it, it involved the ASO here in Alberta, several other uh, system operators across Canada and, and several other system operators in the United States. Uh, it was a multi-year study. It involved very complex uh, and dynamic modeling. 
And it uh, sought to look at a variety of different uh, penetrations of, of wind generation in Canada. So when I say penetration, it's um, you know, what would happen if we had 10% wind? What would happen if we had 20? All the way up to 35, or possibly even more to 35. So, um, the key finding of the study uh, was that if you had anywhere from 1,500 to 18,000 megawatts of, uh, of wind situated in Alberta, uh, you would only need uh, 1.5 to 2.4% of installed wind capacity uh, from, from something else, from say natural gas or, or whatever the case may be, to firm that wind up. So one myth that we often hear is that if you have one megawatt of wind, you need uh, one megawatt of gas, let's say, to, to make sure that when the wind doesn't blow, uh, that you can, you can supply that load. What the study found, and it's a very reputable study, is that you, let's say if you have a one megawatt of wind, you need 15 kilowatts to 24 uh, kilowatts of, of, of gas to back that up. Um, that, uh, it's, it, it's a pretty complex uh, uh, topic to begin to, to try and get, get, get into. Um, but this is an example of, um, of a real life technical study that demonstrates that you don't need to have, uh, you don't need to have, uh, you, can, you can rely on variable generation. Um, provided you've got a number of different solutions in place, and I'm gonna to get to that uh, in a moment. Uh, the second example that I wanna give is uh, pretty much the extreme stress test for, uh, for variable generation. And this is uh, the solar eclipse in Germany last year. Um, in 2009, that was the last time that there was a solar eclipse during the day in Europe. At that time, uh, there wasn't really any grids that had a lot of uh, solar connected to them. And the day before, it was forecast that there was gonna be Blue skies almost entirely across the uh, entirely across the in, entire country, uh, which if you're an astronomer wanting to see the, the solar eclipse, uh, it's good news. If you're a system operator who is going to lose a lot of solar generation, then it's it's not so hot. Um, it was forecast that they could lose 18 gigawatts of a total from a total load of of, of, of 72. Um, Alberta's got about 16 gigawatts of of, of total installed capacity. So it was forecast that they were gonna lose the equivalent to all or more than uh, Alberta's total installed capacity. So this is no, this is no small, uh, uh, this, is no, this, this is a pretty big deal. Um, so what they found was accurate forecasting and planning, uh, first of all, ensured no critical events. Um, everything continued to, to, to work fine, that the proverbial lights uh, stayed on. Uh, the imbalances that they experienced were no greater than during normal operation. Uh, deviation from nominal frequency remained within range, and uh, primary reserves uh, were, were barely used. Um, there's a number of different solutions and, uh, and approaches that... Uh, go ahead. What is that barely used number and percentage? Uh, I, the, uh, the report uses the term barely used. Uh, I think that there's a figure in there. I can't even think what the, uh, what the metric would be. Uh, I guess it'd be megawatts per. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but um, it's it's pretty it's pretty negligible. Uh, the re the report was released by um, it was produced by authors from the Fraunhofer Institute. It's available online. It's it's a uh, if folks are interested in this topic, it's it's a really good read. Um, so, what are the solutions to, to being able to, to manage uh, some of the amounts of variable generation that we've been talking about today? Um, so, first of all, increasing reserves and margins. Um, if you've got a situation where wind and solar are, are this amount of your, of your total load, the amount of your total generation that's variable is, uh, is, is very small. And the amount by which wind and solar uh, vary, again, in itself is small. So, you're talking about you know, uh, per, one, two, three percent. You know, max at, at any given time. So, you can have a lot of uh, a lot of capacity on there, um, a, a variable capacity, and, and the, the variable impact is is, is very small. Um, Interjurisdictional interties. Uh, one of the ways in which Germany and Denmark are, are able to to achieve what they do achieve is that uh, they they're connected to all of their neighbors and they're able to use that to to, to balance supply and demand. Uh, main, maintain grid stability. Um, Alberta has, has several interties. Um, 
you can use a number of these different solutions in combination. You don't necessarily have to have them all. Um, without more interties, you could use some of these more uh, some more of these solutions, and you wouldn't need them. But interties is definitely uh, uh, an option that's that's available to, to, to assist to get higher higher penetrations. Uh, third thing is accurate forecasting. Uh, an example I use is uh, the island of uh, Singapore, uh, tropical island, and. Um, most of their electricity, or sorry, most of their energy is imported because they've got no, no, no natural resources. And um, within the course of a 45-minute of a 45 minute, um, 45 minute span, they can go from uh, blue skies, beautiful, picturesque, to an entire tropical storm uh, consuming the entire island. Um, they don't have a lot of solar on the grid right now, but any new generation is likely going to be uh, some form of renewable. Uh, because it's, it's significantly less, uh, less expensive than new generation of, of other forms. Um, so long story short, uh, they've, they've developed forecasting to be able to know uh, when the, 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 the tropical storms are going to come in, and they're able to, uh, to, to, to plan and, and mitigate and measure that. Um, and the, 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 the accuracy for forecasting is getting, um, getting more and more precise. A uh, province like Alberta doesn't have the same oceanic effects uh, and is much more, uh, much more predictable than the places like Singapore. So uh, the ability to, to forecast this variability is, is very strong. Um, storage is something that we hear an awful lot about. Um, uh, Tesla is beginning to, to make, it, uh, make it appealing and, and commercialize it for, for, for residences. Um, it's probably going to be a while before everybody has a storage uh, battery in, in, in their basement. But well, what we are beginning to see um, is, is large grid-connected uh, batteries to help to provide some, uh, some things like frequency support and voltage support to maintain the grid stability as the wind and solar are, are, are varying on a, on a local level. Uh, load flexibility, uh, that means that, um, for instance, you've got a, a paper mill and um, the, the ASO says, oh, we've got a cloud coming in. So they, give the, um, they send a signal to the paper mill and say, can you uh, reduce your demand or can you increase your demand? Uh, there's a num uh, these things are also called demand response or load shedding. Uh, they're in use all across North America. Um, you can provide services um, on, like on, on a, on a, as, as quick as a minute or as a few seconds. And this kind of thing is another, another uh, solution that the ASO would have to, to help to manage uh, variability. Um, on a more local level, uh, power electronics are getting pretty smart. The internet is uh, getting into every different device. So uh, you can have what they call a virtual power plant. You've got all of these solar uh, systems on roofs uh, across a very diverse area. And you've got them all feeding into one computer, one location. And that, uh, that computer can control them all. So it's like a power plant. The only difference is it's instead of being on one site, it's on many. Um, and uh, yeah, I think so. I think those are some of the, the, the solutions that uh, that can be employed in, in varying degrees to help to manage uh, these these higher penetrations of uh, of variable generation.